This season, prepare for every season with the Allbirds Mizzle Collection. These shoes were made for adventures in rain, shine, mist, or snow. Go to allbirds.com and use code FRESHSOCKS for a free pair of socks with your purchase. This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 79, for broadcast on the 11th of October 2017. Coming up on Space Time, a possible cradle of life discovered on Mars, chemical signatures of life discovered near and far, and confirmation that high-energy cosmic rays come from distant galaxies. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Evidence of massive ancient seafloor hydrothermal vent deposits have been discovered on Mars. Hydrothermal vents found on the deep sea mid-ocean ridges of Earth pump a rich chemical soup into the surrounding oceans, which many scientists believe could be where life on Earth began. The Martian deposits were detected in the Eridania Basin on the red planet's southern hemisphere by NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft. The authors interpret the data as evidence that these deposits were formed by heated water from a volcanically active part of the planet's crust entering the bottom of a large sea long ago. Paul Niles from NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, says the volcanic activity combined with standing water provided the sorts of conditions on Mars that were likely very similar to conditions that existed on Earth at about the same time, crucially a time when early life was evolving. Mars today is a freeze-dried desert, with neither standing water nor volcanic activity. But 3.7 billion years ago, when these deposits were formed, the red planet was a warm, wet world with a thick atmosphere. Earth, of course, still has these hydrothermal vent environments, and they play a host to a wide variety of life forms that can thrive without sunlight on the chemical energy extracted from rocks from deep inside the planet. But due to Earth's active crust and plate tectonics, our planet holds little direct geological evidence preserved from the time when life first began. And that's why the Eridiania seafloor deposits on Mars are of such importance. Not only are they of great interest for those exploring Mars, but they also represent a window into the early Earth. It was observations by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter Spectrometer which provided the data for identifying minerals in massive deposits within the Eridiania Basin, which lies in a region with some of the red planet's most ancient exposed crust. The site, therefore, provides a compelling story for a deep, long-lived sea and a deep-sea hydrothermal environment analogous to the deep-sea hydrothermal vents found on Earth. So it's seen as a place where life may have formed and survived on other worlds. Life that doesn't need a nice atmosphere or temperate surface, just rocks, heat and water. And the ancient Martian Eridania Sea held a lot of water, some 210,000 cubic kilometres of it. Now to put that in perspective, that's as much as all the other lakes and seas on ancient Mars combined, and about nine times more than the combined volume of all of North America's Great Lakes. The mix of minerals identified from the spectroscopic data included serpentine, talc and carbonate, and the shape and texture of the thick bedrock layers led to identifying them as possible seafloor hydrothermal deposits. The area also has lava flows that post-state the disappearance of the sea. Researchers think that's important because it's evidence that this is an area of the Martian crust which is volcanically susceptible and therefore could have produced a similar environment earlier when the sea was still present. You're listening to Space Time... I'm Stuart Gary. Scientists have detected Freon-40, a chemical signature of life, both around a distant star and much closer to home in a comet orbiting the Sun. The discovery, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, includes the first ever detection of a saturated organohalogen chemical compound in interstellar space. Freon-40, which is also known as methyl chloride and chloromethane, 
was detected around the infant triple star system IRAS 162932-2422, located about 400 light years away in the Rofuchi star forming region. Coincidentally, Freon 40 has also been detected by the European Space Agency's Rosetta spacecraft in the exosphere surrounding the comet 67P Sheremov Gerasimenko. Because Freon 40 is formed by organic processes on Earth, it's long been considered a potential marker of extraterrestrial life. The first exoplanet, 51 Pegasi b, was discovered back in December 1994. Since then, more than 3,000 exoplanets have been detected, and so the prime focus has now moved away from simply finding exoplanets to finding those planets capable of supporting life. And that's where organohalogens such as Freon 40 come in. They're thought to be the chemical markers that might indicate the potential presence of life. A vital step is determining which molecules could indicate life, but establishing reliable markers remains a tricky process. Organohalogens consist of halogens such as chlorine or fluorine bonded with carbon and sometimes other elements. On Earth, methyl chloride is created through biological processes in organisms ranging from humans to fungi, as well as in industrial processes such as the production of dyes and medical drugs. The study's lead author, Edith Fayol, from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts, says finding Freon 40 in these young sun-like stars was surprising because her team didn't predict its formation and wasn't expecting to see it in such significant concentrations. It's now become clear that these molecules must form readily in stellar nurseries, therefore providing insights into the chemical evolution of planetary systems. The findings suggest organohalogens are likely to be a constituent in the so-called primordial soup both on the young Earth and on nascent terrestrial exoplanets. Therefore, rather than indicating the presence of existing life, organohalogens may instead be an important element in the little understood chemistry involved in the origin of life. The Freon 40 was detected in the IRAS 16293-2422 star system using the European Southern Observatory's Atacama Millimeter Submillimeter Array Telescope in Chile. Coincidentally, ALMA had also previously found glycoaldehyde, a simple form of sugar, in gas surrounding the same star system. The Freon 40, found around Comet 67P sheremov gerasimenko was detected using the Rosetta spacecraft's Rosina instrument. The discoveries show that the building blocks of life may need to be in the right place at the right time to be included in planets forming around a star. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A 50-year-long debate has finally been resolved, with confirmation that the highest energy cosmic rays originate from sources far beyond our galaxy. The findings, reported in the journal Science, are based on the uneven distribution of high-energy cosmic rays bombarding the Earth from different positions across the sky. The data collected by the ground-based cosmic ray detectors of the Pia Orga collaboration shows that most of the high-energy cosmic ray subatomic particles reaching the Earth originate from locations other than the Milky Way. Cosmic rays are protons, electrons and atomic nuclei travelling through space at relativistic velocities close to the speed of light. Low energy cosmic rays are known to originate from the Sun and from within the Milky Way galaxy. But ever since they were first detected in the 1960s, the origins of high energy cosmic rays has remained a mystery. In the new study, some 30,000 high energy cosmic rays were detected by the Auger Observatory having been accelerated to energies a million times greater than that possible in man-made particle accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider. High-energy cosmic rays are extremely rare, arriving at Earth at a rate of only about one per square kilometre per year. To detect them, scientists needed to build the largest cosmic ray observatory ever constructed, a giant array of cosmic ray detectors spread out across the Argentinian pampas. The high-energy cosmic rays were detected between 2004 and 2016, with arrival directions showing that the particles were coming from a region of the sky located some 120 degrees from the galactic center with approximately 6% higher frequency than what you'd expect if the flux were perfectly uniform. Because this direction isn't associated with potential sources either in the galactic plane or in the galactic bulge, it provides the first convincing evidence that these high-energy cosmic rays really do have an extragalactic origin. When cosmic rays collide with molecules in the upper atmosphere, they generate cascades of more than 10 billion secondary particles, primarily electrons, photons and muons. 
These air showers can cover an area exceeding 40 square kilometres by the time they reach the ground. And that's where the Auger Observatory comes in. The cascade of secondary particles is either directly detected through telescopes recording light created by the particles in the atmosphere, or by the observatory's array of 1,600 particle detectors comprising tanks of pure water spaced 1.5 kilometres apart and covering some 3,000 square kilometres in area. Photoreceptors in these tanks detect Cherenkov radiation produced by the particles hitting water molecules. By comparing the arrival times of particles at different detectors, it's possible to determine where the cosmic ray that produced the air shower came from. But while both techniques can determine the arrival direction and energy of the original cosmic ray, the actual sources for these subatomic particles are yet to be pinned down. Astronomers speculate sources for high-energy cosmic rays are likely to be extreme events, things like supermassive black holes at the centres of distant galaxies hundreds of millions of light-years away, or possibly massive shocks generated by colliding galaxies or from distant gamma-ray bursts from supernova explosions. The Auger Observatory is a collaboration involving some 400 scientists from 18 countries. One of the researchers involved in the study, Professor Bruce Dawson from the University of Adelaide, says scientists observed an uneven pattern in the arrival directions across the sky, with an excess of cosmic rays from a direction where the density of other galaxies is relatively high. He says there's less than a one in a million chance of this pattern arising from an underlying uniform arrival direction. And that's a clear indication that the particles originated from outside the Milky Way. Dawson says it's also the first conclusive evidence that real atomic nuclei material, not just starlight, arrives on Earth from distant galaxies. Cosmic rays are charged particles, actually nuclei of atoms that have been stripped of all their electrons and they're whizzing through space at almost the speed of light. So a large portion of the cosmic rays are protons, but there are also nuclei of heavier elements like uh, oxygen and nitrogen all the way up to iron. Do we know how they're made and how they reach the sorts of speeds they reach? Well, we've got some ideas. I mean, I should mention that one of the problems with cosmic rays is that they are charged particles and there are magnetic fields that exist in the galaxy, in our Milky Way galaxy, and in between our galaxy and other galaxies. And that makes these cosmic rays bend in their propagation to us from their sources. And low-energy cosmic rays in particular bend a lot in the magnetic field. The higher-energy cosmic rays, the sort of cosmic rays that the Pierre Roger Observatory looks at, don't bend so much, but they still bend. And so this has always been a problem in cosmic rays, trying to work out where their sources are. But theoretically, we believe that they ought to have sources in very extreme environments, in the universe, for example, in uh, supernova explosions within our Milky Way galaxy, for example. We think this is possibly where the mid-range cosmic rays come from. They're accelerated in the explosion of a massive star through uh, shock waves that are produced in that explosion and the particles bounce backwards and forwards between an ever-expanding shock wave and gain energy that way. So we've got certain ideas about how they might be accelerated and the very energetic cosmic rays, the ones that the Pierre Roger Observatory look at, we think would have to come from something much bigger than a supernova explosion, something much more powerful. And perhaps that would be uh, the, the jets that are emitted from what we call active galaxies. So uh, there's a supermassive black hole in the centre of some galaxies that is feeding on material, and some of that material is shot out in jets uh, perpendicular to the, the accretion around that supermassive black hole. And we think in those jets there are these shock waves that might accelerate cosmic rays to the very highest energies, but that's still a bit of speculation. And at the other end of the scale, of course, there are the low energy ones, and most of them are thought to come from the sun. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the cosmic ray spectrum, the range of energies goes over about 10 orders of magnitude in energy, and so the very low energy ones come from the sun, that's right, and the medium energy ones we think may come from supernova explosions, and uh, the highest energy cosmic rays uh, we think come from outside of our galaxy. That description you gave earlier of what cosmic rays are, that's uh, very similar, to, especially when you look at the low energy ones coming from the sun, that's very similar to the description one gets for the solar wind. Well, that's right. I mean, the, the, the solar wind contains cosmic rays. I mean, it contains uh, protons, it contains electrons that have been accelerated in uh, solar flares and that sort of thing on the surface of the sun. I guess uh, one difference is that uh, at very high energies, we don't see electrons. We only see protons and, and nuclei of other atoms. And we believe that's because electrons are very hard to accelerate to very high energies. They 
have very efficient energy loss mechanisms. So as you accelerate them, they lose their energy just as fast. And so it's really hard to accelerate electrons. But for protons and uh, nuclei of heavier atoms, it's somehow easier. And this is where your research comes in and the, the research done by this, in, this huge team. I think it's like you know, 400 researchers from around That's the world right. have been involved in this. And you guys have been looking at exactly where the high energy cosmic rays are coming from. And there has been a trend. You've actually seen a trend which uh, indicates they're not coming from within our own galaxy. That's right. So we're looking at the most energetic cosmic rays. They're intrinsically the most interesting because they actually happen to be the, the most energetic particles we know about in the universe. They're sort of microscopic particles, these protons and nuclei of atoms that have macroscopic energies and they're whizzing through space at enormous speeds, very, very close to the speed of light. So they're, they're intrinsically the most interesting cosmic rays, but unfortunately they're also the rarest. And uh, we measure their rate of arrival at Earth in terms of, say, well, at these particular energies, they arrive at a rate of one per square kilometre per year. And so one needs a very large observatory to uh, to catch sufficiently large numbers of these cosmic rays to sort of identify where they're coming from. And that's what Auger has done, the Pierre Auger project has done over the past uh, 12 years. We've collected about 30,000 cosmic rays with energies bigger than 10 to the 19 electron volts. That's two joules of energy in a single cosmic ray particle. And we've determined that they come from, there's a broad unevenness in the pattern of their arrival on the sky. And they come from a direction which is not at all related to the, the Milky Way galaxy. The, the excess on the sky is, is well away from the galactic center, our galaxy's uh, center, and well away from the plane of the Milky Way. And this broad excess comes from a direction which is uh, coincident with uh, an excess of galaxies in the local universe. The fact that you can see That's more right. galaxies in that part of the sky, does that provide more hints as to the possible source, possible cause? Well, uh, so, so, so the excess of these high energy cosmic rays is coincident with, a, with, a, with the direction where, where there is a slight over density in the number of galaxies in our local universe. Unfortunately, at these energies, the excess on the sky is, is quite broad. At this stage, we're unable to identify particular galaxies within that direction that are providing these uh, cosmic rays. So we've got two strategies to address that. Perhaps I should go backtrack for a second and just say another major discovery that the Pierre Auger Observatory has made is that we've discovered that the highest energy cosmic rays are not all protons, which was the conventional wisdom when the project started. We've discovered that there is a mixture of um, cosmic ray nuclei or, or nuclei in the cosmic ray, the cosmic rays that are hitting the Earth, and this has some. This implies some difficulty in identifying the sources of the cosmic rays. Protons, being only singly charged, travel in straighter lines through space with these magnetic fields. But things like oxygen nuclei or, or even iron nuclei would bend a lot. And the fact that we have a mixture of uh, nuclei in the cosmic rays that hit Earth means that it is more difficult to identify their sources unless you can identify on an event-by-event -event basis, which cosmic rays are protons and which cosmic rays are heavier than protons. And the Pierre Auger Observatory is currently undergoing an upgrade, which will allow us to do that on a uh, particle-by-particle -particle basis. In other words, estimate whether these are protons or something heavier. And we hope to be able to just look at the sky map for proton cosmic rays and in that way uh, sort of home in, in more sensitively on the sources of the cosmic ray. How do you detect a cosmic ray? How does the particle detector work? The, the basis of the technique is cosmic ray air showers, we call them. And uh, what an air shower is, is uh, when a cosmic ray, high energy cosmic ray strikes the top of our atmosphere, it, it collides with a nucleus of air, so a nitrogen molecule, for example, and that initiates a cascade of subatomic particles, uh, which travels down through the atmosphere at the speed of light. Essentially, that cascade of subatomic particles is matter that's produced out of the energy of the original cosmic ray hitting the atmosphere. And these air showers, as we call them, can be enormous. Um, a single cosmic ray can produce a cascade that contains tens of billions of particles, which has out over several square kilometres at ground level. So one way that Pierre Auger Observatory observes these air showers is with an array of particle detectors on the ground. We cover an area of 3,000 square kilometres actually at our observatory in uh, western Argentina. And this air shower will hit a whole bunch of these detectors on the ground and we can measure the particle densities in those detectors and reconstruct the energy and direction of the original cosmic ray. So that's one way we do it. And another way we do 
do it is we look for a flash of light in the atmosphere, which is triggered by the passage of this air shower through the atmosphere. So we've got a couple of different ways of detecting the air showers and therefore the cosmic rays that produce them. And uh, both of our techniques allow us to measure the incoming direction of the cosmic ray and its energy. We've just had the announcement by LIGO of another gravitational wave discovery of two black holes merging. So we're now seeing not just photons being used to study the universe, we're now studying it with gravitational waves. And I guess at the other end, we can also now study it with particles such as the cosmic rays that you guys are looking at. That's right. It's quite amazing to think that uh, we're getting bombarded, our Earth is getting bombarded with particles, uh, protons and nuclei of atoms that have travelled maybe up to 300 million light years from some distant galaxy. So this is real stuff, real atomic material which is raining down on the Earth, as well as the uh, the light from distant galaxies and stars and and, the, and now the gravitational waves. That's Professor Bruce Dawson from the University of Adelaide's High Energy Astrophysics Group. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one worded in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Astronomers say a large cloud of dust remains the most likely cause for the mysterious changes in brightness seen to be affecting Tabby Star. The star, officially named KIC 8462852, is a spectral type F main sequence star, located 1,280 light years away in the constellation Cygnus the Swan. The star is about 1.43 times as massive and 1.58 times as big as the Sun. It's informally called Tabby's Star after Tabitha Boyajan from the Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, who was the lead author of the original paper studying the strange star. Tabby's Star became famous in 2015 when astronomers looking through data from NASA's planet hunting Kepler Space Telescope reported strange irregular changes in the amount of light coming from the star. These irregularities were very different from the usual changes caused by things like transiting planets. Instead, they included a sudden, very dramatic 22% dimming in brightness of the star over just a few days, as well as more gradual episodes of both dimming and brightening coming from the star. No other star out of the more than 200,000 that Kepler's measured during its original four-year mission behaves in exactly this way. And these events are continuing, with the most recent occurring in a series of three-day spurts this year. Possible explanations suggested so far include swarms of orbiting comets, the cataclysmic destruction of an orbiting planet, huge orbiting dust rings, or possibly clouds of interstellar dust, all of which could be blocking out some of the light emitted by the star as seen from Kepler's point of view. On the other hand, the star itself could be undergoing some sort of change, either through a stellar cycle generating star spots or some other type of geomagnetic eruptions. One study suggested that the star is being orbited by a ring planet and clusters of asteroids, while another suggested that the star is simply running out of fuel, although all indications are that the star is happily on the main sequence fusing hydrogen into helium in its core. And given that fact and where it is in its expected lifetime, it should actually be gradually brightening, not growing dimmer. While some of these hypotheses can partially explain what the observers are seeing, no single explanation can fully explain all the strange erratic light curve characteristics seen in the star using standard astrophysics or stellar evolution models. And that's where Tabby Star made worldwide headlines, when one frustrated astronomer, jokingly and very offhandedly, suggested that dimming and brightening episodes may even have been caused by some kind of alien megastructure such as a Dyson sphere around the star. Now, the Dyson Sphere isn't named after a failed New South Wales cricketer, but after the famous theoretical physicist and mathematician Freeman Dyson, who postulated how an advanced alien civilization could power their technology by harnessing all the energy of their host star by simply surrounding it with a massive power harvesting sphere, a so called Dyson Sphere. Now, the astronomer who made the claim was being flippant when he said it, but that certainly didn't stop the tabloid press in lapping it up. And the rest is history, or should we say infamy. 
The new study, using NASA's Spitzer and Swift Space Telescopes, together with ground-based optical observations from the Belgian Astrolabe's IRIS Observatory, supports the earlier suggestion that the cause of the dimming, over long periods at least, is most likely to be an uneven dust cloud moving around the star. That's because astronomers detected less dimming in the infrared light coming from the star than what was observed in its ultraviolet light. You see, any object larger than dust particles would dim all wavelengths of light equally when passing in front of Tabby's star. The findings are based on observations made between January and December 2016 in ultraviolet using SWIFT and in infrared using Spitzer. Supplementing the space telescopes, the researchers also observed the star in visible light during the same period using Astrolabe's Iris Observatory's 68cm reflecting telescope. The authors suggest the dust cloud circles the star at a roughly 700 Earth day orbital period. The study also suggests that the objects causing the long period dimming of Tabby's star could be no more than a few micrometers in diameter. That's about a tenth of an inch in the old scale. Based on the strong ultraviolet dip, researchers determined that the blocking particles must be bigger than interstellar dust, small grains that could be located anywhere between the Earth and the star. See, particles that small wouldn't remain in orbit around the star because pressure from starlight would drive them out of the system and into interstellar space. However, larger circumstellar dust particles would be big enough to continue orbiting the star, but not so big as to uniformly block light at all wavelengths. While the new results provide a good explanation for the star's longer-term dimming episodes, it still fails to address those shorter-term dimming events. Nor does it address that sudden 22% dimming which first brought the star to everyone's attention. For that, the authors suggest a swarm of maybe hundreds of comets, which also happen to be a major source of dust orbiting stars, are still considered the best candidates. However, while such a large amount of comets and debris would be capable of blocking enough light to dim the star considerably, and at irregular intervals, the temperature of most of the dust and debris associated with a horde of disintegrating comets would make it glow in the infrared, and that's something the Spitzer telescope would have seen. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has confirmed that nations with a higher standard of living and better access to health care also have higher rates of cancer. The report by scientists from the University of Adelaide claims the outcomes are a result of relaxed natural selection because modern medicine is enabling people to survive cancers, allowing their genetic prodigy to be passed on to the next generation. The findings indicate the rates of some cancers has doubled and even quadrupled in the past 100 to 150 years because human evolution has moved away from survival of the genetically fittest. The study shows an accumulation of cancer incidents over four to five generations. The findings are based on global cancer data from the World Health Organization, as well as other health and socioeconomic databases from the United Nations and the World Bank of 173 countries. The researchers say modern medicine has enabled the human species to live much longer than would otherwise be expected in the natural world. Besides the obvious benefits that modern medicine gives, it also brings with it an unexpected side effect, allowing genetic material to be passed on from one generation to the next, which predisposes people to have poor health, such as type 1 diabetes or cancer. The study determined that the 10 countries with the lowest opportunities for natural selection are Iceland, Singapore, Japan, Switzerland, Sweden, Luxembourg, Germany, Italy, Cyprus and Andorra. While the countries with the highest opportunities for natural selection are Burkina Faso, Chad, the Central African Republic, Afghanistan, Somalia, Sierra Leone, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Guinea-Bissau, Burundi and Cameroon. Researchers found that the rates of cancer in the 10 most affluent countries was 10 times greater than in the 10 worst countries. Testicular cancer was 14 times higher, lung cancer 12 times higher, with smoking accounting for 50% of those cancers, skin melanoma 10 times higher, brain cancer 6.5 times higher, pancreatic cancer 5.1 times higher, prostate cancer and leukemia were both 3.5 times higher, breast cancer was 2.7 times higher, and ovarian cancer was twice as high. Interestingly, only cervical cancer went the other way, with rates of cervical cancer five times higher among nations with the highest opportunities for natural selection. The researchers, however, speculate that could possibly be due to poor hygiene. 
A new study warns that summer Arctic sea ice convergence could disappear completely within around 30 years because of human-induced climate change. The findings by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change are based on a quantitative analysis showing an acceleration of melting ice through a feedback loop. It seems dark water surfaces absorb more heat than white ice surfaces, thus melting more ice and making more water surfaces in the Arctic Ocean in what's called an ice ocean albedo feedback. The study found ice ocean albedo feedback has emerged as a key cause of sea ice melt. The feedback is generated by a large difference in albedo, the measurement of light reflectivity between open water and ice surfaces. As dark ocean surfaces absorb more light than white ice surfaces, solar heat input through the open water melts sea ice, increasing both open water areas and heat input, and thus accelerating sea ice melting. In fact, during summer, ice-covered sea areas of the Arctic Ocean have nearly halved since the 1970s and 80s, raising alarm bells that the ocean is shifting from a multi-year to a seasonal ice zone. Analyzing the data from 1979 to 2014, researchers found that solar heat input through open water surfaces correlated well with ice melt volume, suggesting that heat input is the major causative factor for ice melting. A new study claims autism spectrum disorders are less common among the children of mums who took multivitamins early on in their pregnancy. The findings, reported in the British Medical Journal, are based on a study of 273,000 mother-child pairs in Sweden, finding around 1 in 400 cases of autism for mums who took multivitamins compared to around 1 in 200 for mums who didn't. The scientists, however, stress their findings don't establish cause and effect, but say the research warrants further investigation. Autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, includes a range of conditions, including Asperger's syndrome, that affect a person's social interaction, communications, interests and behaviour. It's estimated that about one in every 100 people has ASD, and more boys are diagnosed with the condition than girls. The research indicates ASD most likely develops in the womb, and a mother's diet during pregnancy could have an influence. But results from previous studies have been inconsistent, suggesting that other unrelated factors, such as a mother's overall health and lifestyle, could also play a role. After humans and Neanderthals met many thousands of years ago, the two species began interbreeding. Although Neanderthals aren't around anymore, about 2% of their DNA survives in non-African people living today. Recent studies have shown that some of these Neanderthal genes have contributed to human immunity and modern diseases. Now, researchers reporting in the American Journal of Human Genetics have found that this Neanderthal inheritance also contributed to other characteristics, including skin tone, hair colour, sleep patterns, mood, and even a person's smoking status. Now, researchers reporting in the American Journal of Human Genetics have found that this Neanderthal inheritance has also contributed to other characteristics, including skin tone, hair colour, sleep patterns, mood, and even a person's smoking status. Researchers looked at data from 112,000 participants in the UK Biobank pilot study, which includes genetic data along with information on many traits related to physical appearance, diet, sun exposure, behaviour and disease. Previous studies had already suggested that human genes involved in skin and hair biology were strongly influenced by Neanderthal DNA. The new work shows that skin tone and the ease with which one tans, as well as hair colour, are also affected. The findings suggest that Neanderthals would have differed in their hair and skin tone as much as people do now. The traits influenced by Neanderthal DNA, including skin and hair pigmentation, mood and sleeping patterns, are all linked to sunlight exposure. When modern humans arrived in Eurasia between 60 and 100,000 years ago, Neanderthals had already lived there for thousands of years, and they were likely already well adapted to lower and more variable levels of ultraviolet radiation from the sun than what the new human arrivals from tropical Africa were accustomed to. The thing is, skin and hair colour, as well as circadian rhythms and mood, are all influenced by light exposure. The researchers speculate that their identification in the new study suggests that sun exposure may have shaped Neanderthal phenotypes, and that gene flow into modern humans continues to contribute to variations in these traits today. And finally for now, Old Faithful is Yellowstone National Park's most famous landmark. Millions of visitors come to the park each year to watch the geyser erupt every 44 to 125 minutes. But despite Old Faithful's fame, relatively little is known about the geologic anatomy of the structure and fluid pathways that fueled the geyser below the surface. 
Now, a report in the journal Geophysical Research Letters has mapped the near-surface geology around the hydrothermal feature, revealing a reservoir of heated water which feeds the geyser's surface vent and how the ground shaking behaves between eruptions. The map was made possible by a dense network of portable seismographs and a new seismic analysis technique. The famous geyser and other volcanic features in Yellowstone National Park are simply the surface manifestations of two active magma reservoirs at depths of between 5 and 40 kilometres which provide heat to the overlying near-surface groundwater. In some places within Yellowstone, the hot water manifests itself in pools and springs, while in other places it takes the form of explosive geysers. When analysing data from a dense network of seismometers, scientists could determine the shape, size and location of Old Faithful's hydrothermal reservoir. Researchers think the reservoir is actually a network of cracks and fractures through which water flows. It has a diameter of around 200 metres and can hold approximately 300,000 cubic metres of water. By comparison, each eruption of Old Faithful actually only releases about 30 cubic metres of water. You're listening to Space Time, I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Audioboom, YouTube, from spacetimewithstuartgary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. The shows also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one worded in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 